Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Sayyidah Kubra. 
I have to unmute you. If you can unmute. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you this evening for you? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. How are you? I am good, alhamdulillah. I think that we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to um, open up with Al-Fatiha and then I will invite you to um, open up with uh, a dua if you'd like. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the interview, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawm Al-Din. Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustakeen. Sirat Al-Ladhina Al-Amta Alayhim. Ghayri Al-Maktubi Alayhim. Walad Ramin. Ameen. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum again. Sayyidah Kubra, would you prefer that I... Um, give an intro to you uh, and say a little bit about who you are uh, before you start us off with a dua, or would you like to start with a dua? It's up to you. <laughs> Inshallah. I think what I'll do is go ahead and get started with your, um, a little bit about who you are. So I have a very formal bio for Seda Kubra, Sise, uh, uh, Askari, and I also uh, was on a, a chat with a group of sisters, uh, Murids, uh, in the Tarika, and one of them just, you know, um, spontaneously just kind of gave this testimony about Sadie Cooper that I thought was so beautiful. So I'm going to start with that, and then tie in other aspects of Sadie Cooper's work. Before I start, I will introduce myself. I am Sister Aisha Kareem, and um, I am a lifelong friend of Seda Kubra. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and so we started off in grade school together, and we graduated from Muhammad Schools of Atlanta in seventh grade prior to Seda Kubra moving to Medina Bay, Senegal. So for those of you who do not know, Seda Kubra is Sheikh Mahi's wife, uh, originally from Atlanta. She moved to Senegal at the age of 13 to memorize the Quran, which she completed by the age of 21. She was the second American woman to have memorized the Quran in Medina by Senegal and has now established her own Quran school, as well as a preschool for children before they enter the Quran school or madrasa. She is also a mother figure and also a mother of her own. And for many American students and also students from other parts of West Africa who come to Medina Bay to study Quran and other um, aspects of Islamic studies. Many children have lived with Kubra over the years. She epitomizes grace and humility and service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that seems almost effortless, subhanAllah. One of the things that makes Sayyidah Kubra especially special is that not only is she the wife of Sheikh Mahi, she was, is also a murid and lover of Sheikh Hassan Sisei radiallahu anhu, which is one of the reasons why she's a perfect role model, mashallah. Her advice isn't just as the wife of a Sheikh, but as a woman on the path. And so without further ado, I will tell you, Sayyidah Kubra, that those are the words of our precious beloved Sakina Pilgrim. And uh, in addition to that, um, Seda Kubra is an educator, community leader. Uh, during her studies, she supported other African-American and African children and youth in her own pursuit of Quranic education. Since 2002, she has housed more than 30 students in her own home in Medina Bay. Under her care, at least six African-American young men and women have become hufaz. In 2003, with the permission and encouragement of Sheikh Hassan Radilahu An, Seda Kubra founded the African American Islamic Institute, AAII Preschool, a school that introduced young children between the ages of three and six to basic Arabic, French, and Islamic studies, as well as other academic subjects aimed at preparing them for future Islamic and secular and academic endeavors. It was the first preschool established in Medina by Senegal. In 2017, after more than 15 years of housing Quran students in her own home in Medina Bay, Seda Kubra established an official dormitory to house international students attending the African American Islamic Institute. In 2018, she opened the African American Islamic Institute Legacy Academy 
one, an international Islamic boarding school that produces global citizens who are champions of truth, life, and equality. Her various educational and humanitarian efforts are inspired by her beloved Sheikh, the late Sheikh Hassan Sisi Rari Lahuan, whose life mission was the advancement of humanity through initiatives in education, healthcare, and dissemination of information. Seda Kuber lives in Medina Bay with her husband, Sheikh Mohammed Mahi Sise, Mohammedu Mahi Sise, and her daughter, Umu Suleiman Sise. So, again, welcome, uh, Seda Kubra. Of course, we Thank had you. to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, at this point, I would love for you if you could kind of open us before we start the interview with maybe a dua, inshallah, or any words. Um, I'll start. I'll re re recite Fatiha and Salat Fatiha and dua, inshallah. I'll give you a shout out to the regime. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, Maliki, Omidin. Ya can I would do ya can I stay in the Nasarat Mustafim, Sirat Ladina and Amtali him, Hoyer and Mahadu Yari him, what a poor lean. I mean, Law Masalia, Sidna, Mohammed Fatilim, I would cover Hat Minima Sabah, Nasir and Hakabur Hatwa Hadi, Nasarat Kumusakim, Walla, Alia, Kadri, and Tara Lavi, Yahimatisha, Kadri, and I've had the Mahadri with the Hatafi, the Nabit and Tati and the Bahri, Rabbi Shahli, Sadri, and Silly Amri, Walla, and Katan Bissani of Kauli. Subhana Rabbika Rabbi Izzati Amma Yasifun wa salamun ala muslim wa hamdulillah Bismillah Bismillah, alhamdulillah I do want to say um, Alhamdulillah, we are two months out of our trip of a lifetime having the Umrah in uh, in Mecca and Medina Munawara, and so it's good to see you again um, and we have you know, crossed so many milestones together you know, since we have uh, been in grade school and graduating from Muhammad schools in Atlanta. Uh, and then, of course, you know, now we're in our mid 40s and <laughs> and leading, you know, yourself leading institutions and, and teaching in different institutions around the world. Alhamdulillah. So I would like to start the interview. If you could tell us more about your upbringing. Um, and so you are a native of Atlanta, but also born Muslim, um, to two uh, reverts, we would say, to Islam. So if you could tell us about that experience, your Islamic upbringing in America, in Atlanta, and the education that you received from your parents in Atlanta, Brother Aminifu and Sister Khadija Askar. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Um, my parents are Dr. Khadija Askari, which many people in the community know, and Brother Amanifu Askari, who many people also know in the community. My mother is from Philadelphia. My father is from Augusta, Georgia. Uh, we were, I was born and mostly raised in Atlanta. My parents, like many reverts during that time, came to Islam through kind of a, a Pan-Africanist understanding and uh, consciousness. They both attended Tuskegee Institute together and there they embarked upon a journey to educate themselves about Africa. And so uh, uh, subsequently when they had children, they also wanted us to be educated about Africa. A big part of our upbringing and our education, our aunt Jaliwa Awu, uh, she started a school called um, APA, Atlanta Progress Academy. Uh, there were many like-minded people in the community who wanted to raise and teach their children in a way that reflected their values and their understandings and help us to become African Americans that understood that we came from Africa and that we had a responsibility to our people. So in that journey, my parents decided Somebody has to either one, we're gonna have we're gonna send the kids out to public school. And then when, when they come back home, we have to put in the work of trying to correct some of the misinformation that gets taught in public school, or we can, you know, start our own school. And my aunt, may I, um, may I bless her and preserve her, she was the one who volunteered and stepped up and said, Look, I'll be the educator of the children. So all of us, my siblings, my cousins, and again, many like-minded people in the community that some of us know, Sister Nadia and other people, um, they, they came to Atlanta Progress Academy, a school that she started. So alhamdulillah, we were 
raised with a firm consciousness of where we came from, that we came from Africa. I remember even like uh, birthday parties, we had to like recite <laughs> countries in Africa and their capitals before we got birthday presents. And we knew the South African national anthem and you know, all of these things were just to instill in us a strong understanding of who we, are, who we were. From there, um, my, my parents were closely affiliate, affiliated with the West End community, Imam Jamil, so may Allah you know, remove his hardship and difficulty and bless him. So we were closely affiliated with the West End community. From there, we, um, you know, after some time, it was not always easy to kind of sustain a homeschool program or even like a, a school, school program. So we transitioned to Claire Muhammad Schools of Atlanta. I think my first time going to Claire Muhammad, I remember pre-K. <laughs> I remember I was supposed to go to kindergarten, but I think I was with my aunt at that time. So it was, you know, our education was a little bit between Atlanta Progress Academy and um, Claire Muhammad Schools of Atlanta. Uh, just like in any journey, you know, I think that as your understanding grows, desire to learn more and decide to get deeper into a, um, a particular aspect of your life, then a lot puts in your path those things that help you to do that. So like I said, Atlanta Progress Academy was really our first introduction of who we were as Africans in America. And then from there, Claire Muhammad was our first introduction of who we were as Muslims in America. And then from there, the natural progression was, okay, it's time to go to Africa and you know, make that connection to the motherland. Um, my brother was the first one to go to um, to Senegal with Imam Furkan's son, uh, Furkan. And, um, and that is how we started going to Senegal in the, in the first place. So, alhamdulillah. Hello? Alhamdulillah, yes, I'm here. Do you see the picture on the screen? It's been a while since I have done the sharing the screen. And what, <laughs> as a school teacher, you know, during the, the pandemic, I was doing this all the time, but right. it's been a minute so that I've been hosting like something on Zoom. So alhamdulillah, uh, thank you for that introduction. I put this picture here. And as you know, the people in the in the photo, one of my favorite pictures um, that kind of highlights our experience and the experience that you were just reflecting upon. And mm -hmm. of course, to the left, we have um, Sheikh Hassan Sisi Radilahu, and, and then we also have um, another beloved um, African American Muslim leader, Imam Wahdi Muhammad Radilahu Anhu. Uh, and so you spoke about these two different legacies, right? And so coming up in Atlanta um, and starting with homeschool, and then, you know, with parents that uh, went to a historically Black college, University, Tuskegee University, and the history of that uh, in the South, and this idea of the crossover with the early Islamic movements in America, African-American movements, with the idea of doing for self, right? Um, and educating our own. Mm -hmm. And so, even with Imam Dabi Muhammad, which is, of course, the namesake of the school that you're referring to, Clara Muhammad School, Muhammad Schools of Atlanta, of course, his mother, may Allah be pleased with her, Sister Clara Muhammad, homeschooled, right? Because she was not satisfied with the educational um, opportunities in America for her kids. Um, and so, and then, of course, after that, you know, starting um, the institution or the um, Muhammad school system where other families and other children were able to join. Um, and then of course, what I love about the, listening to you and your experiences um, that parallel mine. And, you know, I went to Muhammad schools from pre-K to 12th grade. Um, but of course, because I did not have, my parents didn't have that kind of pan-African, you know, background so much of going back to Africa. Um, it was, it was more so just kind of what's happening in, you know, domestically in the States with the African-American movement and African-American history. Um, so yes, but alhamdulillah. So thank you for sharing that. And then at this time, I would love for you to share just your earliest memories of Sheikh Hassan. So you talk about how you, you left at the age of 13 from Atlanta and you decided, your parents decided now it's time to actually see what 
um, the African culture and uh, Islamic culture in Africa, uh, where our ancestors were from. And so if you could tell us your earliest memories of meeting Sheikh Hassan Radi Lahwan. Um, my very, my earliest memories of meeting Shah Hassan was when he came to Atlanta to visit. He came to Atlanta and I remember my brother was back from Senegal and, you know, we were told that we were going to meet his teacher. So we went uh, with a group to the airport and we received him. And from there, we, uh, at his hotel, they used to always have questions and answers, sicker and things like that going. So our very first meeting with Shahasa was actually in the U.S. before I ever went to Senegal. But this was after my brother had gone. And so, alhamdulillah, at the time, being a young person in that space, didn't necessarily understand the magnitude of who he was and what he represented. But you still got a sense that there was an energy, uh, you know, a high spiritual, important energy uh, in the space. So alhamdulillah, after, after we met him, and like I said, this was after my brother had returned from his first time staying in Senegal, he, my brother went back. So when he went back, my mother planned for, my brother and father both planned for all of us to go because Shahasa used to host an annual conference in December in the Gambia. Now this conference was uh, in English and it was organized by Marids in Gambia who were close associates and talibis of Shahasan. Alhamdulillah, they were able to, in their communities, they were struggling with the youth connecting to Islam and connecting to the Tariqa. Now, in, Sen in Senegal and in Gambia and a lot of West Africa, Sufism is very strong and there are many different Tariqas. Usually families will tend to stick to traditionally whatever it is their family has already been associated with. So it was important for those adults in those spaces to try and give that same influence and legacy to their own children. So they established this conference that would happen every year in the Gambia. And it was an opportunity to, for many Americans to come because it was a time off, it was you know, around Christmas time. And then on top of that, the conferences were um, in English or translated in English for the English speaking guests. Um, so my first time in Senegal was actually when I was 12. We came for the conference in the Gambia we stayed for a couple of weeks and then we went back. And then that same year, my mother came back in June in the summertime and me and my younger brother, Latif, a lot of mercy on him and make his grave spacious and full of light. He, um, he was with me, Bubaka, my mother was already in Senegal at the time. So that time my mother for one month to do spiritual training with the chef. And we were here with her. And that was my first time attending the Quran school. Because for the month that I was here, I was able to attend the Quran school. And our, at the time, the Quran, Yellow House, many of the people listening know what Yellow House is. <laughs> but Yellow House was a house that Shah Hassan had built. And the Americans, many of them, those, those that were there before me, lived there. So, um, Sister Karima. Um, she was the pioneer of the American students coming to stay in Senegal for any extended period of time because she lived there and she was a house mother for them, Yamina you know, Karima and uh, Ahmed Sufi, who you guys interviewed some time ago. All of those people lived at Yellow House. Even my brother time lived at Yellow House. So the school was actually there. Baham Sal uh, was the main teacher and he had an assistant teacher there named Malam Ali and Shahasa had, who was from Nigeria. And she also put him in charge of doing some classes for the sisters because I wasn't the only one there. It was at least about four or five other sisters there. I believe Sister Waduda, um, may Allah have mercy on her. Um, I can't remember the other ladies that were there, but it was at least about four or five of them and me. And so he had a separate class for us, just some basic fic and also learning to read Arabic and short some some stories. So that was my first trip to Senegal. Um, that was when I felt like, okay, I really want to come back and I really want to study 
crying. I really want to stay. Uh, I want to say even that trip, I didn't want to go home. <laughs> but at that time, my brother felt like he was at the end of his tenure in Senegal. So he was saying, like, you can't stay because if you stay, then I have to stay. <laughs> so I'm um, like, he was just like, cover it on play. Get on the plane. We leave it. <laughs> so I remember going to Shahasan and saying, you know, I really want to stay. Shahasan said, don't worry, you know, you'll be back. And when you come back, you'll stay and be able to study. So alhamdulillah, that time. I was 13 and then I did come back in the in the in the winter of that same year and I wound up staying to start studies. Alhamdulillah. Yes. So if you could tell us um, why you wanted to stay in Medina Bay, um, what impression was made upon your heart uh, and your sight and your vision that made you so compelled to come back um, at such a young age to be so determined to come back? And if you could tell us within that about um, your journey to become a Hafiza uh, while at the African American Institute. Well, first, um, you know, in Medina Bay, there is most of the lifestyle is revolved around the routine of the religion. So you hear the Adhan five times a day at the time, you know, we were in Shahasan's house. So we see him walking, going and coming every day for, for the five daily prayers. And there was just this very strong connection for me. Um, well, when I, when I went in the summertime, it was a very strong connection for me to the, to the community and just to the, the rhythm of the lifestyle there. You know, you go, you study Quran. I had by that time, like I said, when I was there for the one month, alhamdulillah, I was able to to memorize one hizb, which is one uh, sixtieth of the Quran, and um, and I just I felt like okay, this is this is what I want to do. When I came back to the U.S., uh, I feel like the following Hajj season, my father and Brother Dawood Jeffries, they made Hajj together. And my mother and Sister Aisha Jeffries, they kept each other company while their husbands were on Hajj. So that time we spent a lot of time at Sister Aisha's house. I'm the last Sister Aisha had an extensive collection on uh, books on Sufism. And at the time I was an avid reader. So I would just spend most of that time just reading, reading, reading about Sufism. And then I was just like, I just, I just need to go back to Medina. I need to just really just immerse myself in like the spiritual way of life. Um, so that was really like the push for me to go back. I remember even by this time, my mother had opened up her practice in Monroe, Georgia. And I just remember the whole time we would go to school on our lunch breaks, I would go to the library and just read books about Sufism. One of one of my favorite books was called The Hundred Letters. It was um, a book about uh, a book of letters compiled um, between a Sufi master and his Marie, and just on different different topics. And so the whole time I was just like, okay, I just need to get back to Medina. Now at this time, I didn't necessarily know that Tariqa Tijaniya was Sufism, but I knew that I wanted to be a Sufi. <laughs> and, um, and, but at the same time, I knew that what I had experienced in Medina was the closest to what I have been reading about when I when it talked about Sufism and just immersing yourself in in um, dedicating your yourself to Allah. Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, so beautiful. And I mean, we have to pause for a moment and you know think about um, the blessing and the gift of our auntie and Haja Aisha Jeffries. Um, and I, it's interesting because, you know, I'm new to the Tariqa, even though I've been around it all my life, you know, starting with you all when I was a child and my closest friends, their parents were in the Tariqa. Um, but I just knew the, the beauty that, you know, emanated from them and their, their rituals and their worship. Uh, but I just joined the Tariqa, I guess, about no more than three years ago. And it's interesting because when I was looking for the literature, you know, some of the, the weird and some of the books, and I just like magically found pieces in my house. And I thought back and I said, you know what, doctor, not doctor, she could be a doctor. Haja Aisha, I think, gave me these, you know, whether I was at her house once or at some event. And she's just so generous in giving us because she knows that this is um, something that we need in our lives. And maybe she saw the light in us like, okay, 
maybe eventually they'll <laughs> they'll be on the path with us. So alhamdulillah, so thank you for sharing that. And alhamdulillah to all of those who inspired you along the way um, so that you can fulfill the potential that you are actualizing now. If we, so we wanna get a little bit further into the interview. Um, if you wish to speak on this, uh, what aspect of your beloved mother, Dr. Ascari's work contributed to your colorful success story in Medina Bay? Um, just yesterday, I was invited to um, a banquet, um, the Abu Bakr Award ceremony, and I was with my father earlier and I just couldn't fit it into my schedule, but someone sent me a video and there was the beautiful, graceful Dr. Ascari, um, you know, facilitating the award ceremony. And I was just like, she's just, she's just amazing. She's just been doing this as long as I can remember since I was a child, you know, just spearheading these movements and just activities and fundraisers um, and just keeping community together. So what ask, if you don't mind speaking about that, um, and if you wish not to, then we can also go to the next question. So, um, so at the time, our very first trips to the U, uh, to Senegal, um, it was before my mother and father were together, but at, at some point, um, they separated, they divorced, and my mother was remarried to Shahassan. So we were Marie's of Shahassan, but we were also uh, children of Shahassan. Um, and she became a very integral part of the mission, the work that he was doing. You know, anything that was happening, you know, she was a part of, and by proxy, <laughs> we were a part of. I remember Sheikh used to host um, different sharifs, and he would want them, you know, to do something special for, for them. And he would, and they would call me and say, Cooper, you know, your mom has a juicer. Go make some, some juice, some fresh juice for the sharif. And, you know, so <laughs> there was always something happening, for sure. And I think that uh, us being able to be in the space and in the household of the sheikh, even not just as Marie, but as family members, you know, it was because of my mother's connection to him. And Alhamdulillah, her connection to him also helped to expand the vision that he had for the work of African American Islamic Institute. So the African American Islamic Institute, right now it has a Quran school, which is a school that I mentioned started at Yellow House, has an Arabic school, it has a clinic and radio station. And alhamdulillah, we would have been there when most of these things have started. I wasn't there when the Crown School started, but I was there before it was in the building that it is in now. And even the, the Arabic school, the catalyst for it was, there was a period where many of the students were not 100% focused on memorization. They were kind of like, okay, you know, I, I memorized some, you know, I'm going to school today. I don't go to school tomorrow, you know, kind of thing. So she said, it makes more sense for us to incorporate Arabic language and Islamic studies for these students so that when they go back to the U.S., they have, you know, a, a plethora of knowledge to take back. And, um, and they're not just, you know, here wasting their time. There's many things that still left to be learned. So the very first Arabic class that started with us, he hired three teachers from Mauritania and they used to give us classes and Shah Mahi was the fourth teacher. If, if anybody didn't show up, he taught us as the substitute. <laughs> and um, from there, then the, the Arabic school was built. But as far as the clinic, my mother, when she first came to Senegal, she saw the need for medical care in the community. And at that time she was working at Southside Medical Center, I think right off of Gresham Road, somewhere over there. And I remember her talking to her colleagues, you know, talking to people in the in the clinic she was working at, getting donations of medicine, getting volunteers to come. Her and um, Sister Zakia from Tennessee, may Allah have mercy on her and expand her grave um, and grant her paradise. She also got a lot of volunteers to come because she was a registered nurse to come and volunteer and do clinic. So when they would come and do clinic, the school was shut down. They would have medicine that was donated and they would just set up and shop in a room. And at the time, Suleiman, I think Robinson was still there, Adam, Adam Islam, and those people were the translators. We didn't speak well or really good yet. <laughs> so they were the translators. And from there, Sheikh used to see people come from 
miles and miles and miles away because they heard American doctors were here and they were giving away medicine. So that was the doorway for the clinic to come to fruition. Sheikh said, okay, if this is the need in the community, we're gonna build a clinic. So alhamdulillah, that is a part, a big aspect of the work that Shah Hassan established in the community. And of course, you know, us being in the, in the school, my main focus right now is education, but at some time I was working with the clinic to try and, and um, I guess uh, revitalize the efforts because some of them had, uh, how do you say, uh, wavered after Sheikh. And so, alhamdulillah, you know, the work that we're doing is the work that our pioneers established, you know. So her, her role in that was, one, if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have known Medina Bai. But also, you know, she didn't come to Medina Bai and just take or just seek what benefit it could be for her. She came to Medina Bai and was of service. So her her model was a model that we saw from the sheikh, but we also saw from her. She was married to the sheikh, she was the sheikh's wife, but at the same time, she was at the clinic till two in the morning or three in the morning with a woman in labor, you know? So it wasn't like your job stops with, you know, being the sheikh's wife, which is all in and of itself a lot of work, but you also have to find ways with the knowledge that Allah has given you to continue to contribute on another level because you have this, you have that level. You know, you don't stop and say, okay, nobody else is doing this. Nobody else is required to or whatever, but you, you look at what Allah has blessed you with and you try and turn to use that to do, to serve Allah through his creation. Ameen, ameen, mashallah, may Allah continue to keep your mother in his presence and to shower mm -hmm. mercy and gifts upon her. I mean, mm -hmm. um, it, it's so true. And, you know, and just listening to your, the testimony about, um, Haja Khadija Skari, it just reminds me of her namesake, you know, um, the mother of the believers, Khadija. And, you know, she was not just someone who took on the um, that role of being one of the first Muslims um, with the beloved, but also she was working in the community, you know, when she, of course, met the prophet uh, and in business and and basically sharing her gifts with the community, right, to to enhance and establish a community. And so it seems like that's what um, Haja Khadija Skari was doing in Medina Bay. So may Allah continue to bless her. I mean, it's true, you know, there's not, it's not so far, far off that um, the first work that was started there with your mother was with the the clinic because you know kids can't learn if they're not well you know families and parents cannot um, prepare their children for school and take care of them um, if they're not well so you know the health uh, and the physical health mental health emotional health of community members is vital and that will then feed into the educational system so um alhamdulillah and that just makes a lot of sense the the order in which those events took place so um you know, you talk about how you were the second um, woman or African-American woman to become a Hafiza, to memorize the Quran. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but although your brother um, went there first, but he, did he not finish or did he, did he finish the Quran? Um, no, he didn't finish. We don't have to focus on that because, you know, just learning even just a, a fraction of the Quran, you know, there's so, there's so much baraka in that. But I do want to ask you, um, and not to, to cut you off, but I want you to be able to just flow into it. So I want to know, how did your family and Sheikh Hassan and your communities in the U.S. and Senegal react to your accomplishment to becoming a Hafiza as the youngest sibling and daughter in your family? So as a girl, a female, um, as and as an African-American, as the second African-American woman who finished uh, Quran at the school. So how did the Sheikh respond to that and, and others in the community? Um, so I studied Quran for seven years. I came when I was 13. I completed it when I was 20. At some point in my studies, because like I said, my mother was there off and on with the clinic and doing other activities in the, in the household of the chef. And we were like in close proximity to that. So of course we were involved in all of those efforts. So at some point, um, it wasn't very easy to focus. One of the benefits of younger children studying Quran is that they don't have anything else on their mind other than what, you know, the instructor or the teacher or the parents try to kind of keep them focused on. 
as, as you get older, you know, as you reach puberty and things like that, it can become a little more difficult because there's just so many things that you think not necessarily that is true, but that you think may be important, you know, as teenagers and, and, and things that are happening and other things that are happening to people that are your age in the community, they start to, to, to crowd, crowd your thought, your, your thoughts. So at one point I actually left Medina Bay and I went to Kose Atlanta, which is about, I don't know the distance, but it's about a 30, 40 minute ride from Medina Bay. And it is a, it was a farm that one of the Lebanese Marines of Sheh gave to him as a gift. And he also, and the, and the Senegalese government extended the, the acreage of the farm to include enough land that would encompass a small city or village uh, with the hopes that he would populate it and establish it as a, as a city. These are some of the efforts that the Senegalese government uses to try and keep the rural areas populated. So Shah Hassan named the community Kosi after his grandfather's village Atlanta because of the connection between his family and the American community. And the intention was that eventually it may have been a space for the Americans to come and establish and build and live. So I, li I lived in Kosi for three years, studying Quran with my teacher who was a nephew of Shahassan. Shahassan, I actually reached out to him and asked him to come personally to teach me when I had moved out to Kosi. And so Shahassan was very involved, very involved with my studies. And I think with, you know, like I said, there's other people that I'm, I think you all will get to interview, but I th he was very involved with all of our studies. Like you couldn't walk in Shahassan's house and he was sitting in his courtyard and he would say, where are you in Quran? Recite for me, you know, go call your teacher. Let me talk to your teacher and to ask why you're not moving or why this or whatever. So Alhamdulillah, Sheikh was very, um, he was very invested in me completing my studies. You know, he helped with advice. He helped facilitate me being in Kosi when I left Medina, he helped with prayers. So Alhamdulillah, when I finished, it was, it was a big deal, you know, because I think by this time, most of the people in the community knew me before I left to go to Kosi. And then they knew that I had gone to Kosi to study. So they were like, okay, who is in Kosi? Like, it's no water out there. There's no electricity. <laughs> so how did, uh, you know, people, I was on the radar, basically, like, she's out in Kosi, like, trying to hash it out. So I'm the Lashek was very, very um, happy when I completed. And they, and, you know, my mother had a big, big, big ceremony the, the in Kosi, Atlanta, actually. I think I, I shared with you personally some photos from the ceremony and they, um, yeah, everybody was really, really excited. So uh, there, at, at one point, even when we came back to the States, I want to say maybe I was in the States for a few months, they organized a award ceremony uh, where they gave all of us, again, recognition for completing Quran at the African-American Islamic Institute and some of the community members there in Atlanta were present, uh, uh, Imam Bilal Mahmoud and other people had came to attend. So alhamdulillah, every, I think that even though it's not a tradition that is very celebrated in our communities, it's becoming a tradition that is very celebrated. Uh, as far as the people here seeing you as African-American, their connection to understanding us as African-Americans is a little different than us identifying as African-Americans. So it's not that, oh, it's an African-American that finished Quran more so than it is an American. Because Sheikh always used to say that, he used to call the teachers and tell them that it was more important for him that the American students got Quran than even his own student, his own children. Because he said, where they're going, Quran is a light, you know, in a place that it doesn't have many lights. So it's important for them to have this Quran, to get the, this Islam to be firmament and to, to be able to take it back to where they're going. Yes, um, you answered or touched on some things that were going through my head as you were speaking. Um, 
of course, I like to think that, you know, people see, <laughs> see how special, you know, we are as a people here that were taken from, from Africa and then brought here. Right. And so I was wondering when you were saying that you were, I love this idea and this imagery around going to coast see Atlanta. And then I was like, did she say Atlanta? Like, is that what I heard? So <laughs> that's a beautiful story. Um, and so the fact that he associated with those who were coming from the States and a lot of you guys were coming from Atlanta at that time. And, and then this idea of putting you in seclusion and all of that. Um, so knowing that you were this precious, you know, um, student, and I wonder, even though you said that it's more so just the fact that you're American and not so much that you're African American and, and the history that goes with that. But do you think, can you speak on maybe what uh, Sheikh Hassan Radi Lohan saw in, in us, you know, like did he, th that special thing that he saw that, that he knew needed nurturing um, and special care and kind of isolation at times? Um, or do you think that I'm just kind of overthinking it or reading into it too much. <laughs> no, I think Shahazan, Shahazan was very unique among even his community, you know. So Shahazan, if I was to single him out, he did have a special connection and understanding of us and where we came from and some of the struggles and some of the hardships and what it meant for us to be Africans in America. Um, but I, I, when I was answering, I, I mean, generally as a whole, you know, as a, as a whole, you know, people will say, oh, American. But Shahazan had a different understanding. You know, when you when you get a chance to to interview Amina Karima, you'll see like Shahasan lived in 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 the states for a while. He studied there, um, so he had a very unique experience with African Americans and understanding some of what it meant to be African American. So yes, his connection with us was very different than the community. Even 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 it, it, yes, it was very different and kind of irreplaceable, really. Um, he made it his business to understand us and understand some of the needs, even some of the young men who at some times families were sending there basically to, to save their life. And so I, I feel like he it is not, it's not an easy way to pinpoint how or why. It's just sometimes a lot endows these people of spiritual standing to have these kinds of insights and to have these kinds of connections so that it can further um, the um. You know, Sheikh was somebody who he had vision. He had vision, not just like, oh yeah, we need, we need a clinic. It was more or less like, for instance, the, when I lived in his house, he used to have, I remember one of his namesakes came from Dakar and he would, he told me, uh, let them go stay with Kubra. At the time I was like 15, 14, you know, let them go stay with Kubra. And then he called me and he said, make sure he knows his salat, make sure he knows how to make wudu. In, in retrospect, all of these things were training for what I'm doing now, you know, and, and, and I'm not the only one that has these kinds of stories. Sheikh knew people and he knew kind of Allah had given him the insight into maybe what they were capable of in the future. So his connection to us was a lot about that. You know, it was about creating a strong, strong connection between the Tijanis in Medina and Tijanis in um, America. But before that, even just Muslim, you know, I remember Sheikh, I, as a young person, I don't remember Sheikh talking to us much about Tijani. You knew he was Tijani, you knew he was Sufi, but most of his conversation as instruction for us was basically Islam, making sure we knew our Islam and how to practice it and to really hold on to it and to love it. Alhamdulillah. I knew there was something I wanted to pull that out of you, inshallah. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Um, can you speak, Seda Cooper, on your role in supporting Sheikh Hassan's humanitarian work a little bit further in Medina Bay? And tell us how, why, when you got started with this Kidma, your main accomplishments and main challenges. I, you know, the preschool, um, AAII, um, Shifa Al Aqsam Clinic, et cetera. So I started, I would say, Everything that I'm doing now started while Sheikh was alive and with his permission. I remember, like I said, when I lived in his house, and at the time I may have been 15 or 14, and he used to send children to me, not even just his namesake. It was more, more than one occasion. He would say, let them go stay with Kubra, let them go stay with Kubra. And at the time he had his family in his house, his wives, his, you know, but there was something that he wanted 
to train in me to be able to do. So by the time I completed Quran, when I first when I moved to Kosi, he sent students out there with me then. So and, and living in Kosi was a very interesting experience because, you know, I ran everything. I, I ran the I ran I ran the kitchen. I ran the house. I ran you know everything that my teacher needed. I was responsible for making sure that happened. You know, it was a very remote village, so you had the program like. The women, when are they going to the market? What are they buying? This is the menu for the week. This is the wash schedule. This is this. So all of those things, like I said, were training. Um, once I finished Quran and came back and I was married, I did mention to Shahas and I said, I had an idea. Alhamdulillah, and this idea came from Shahmai's daughter, Mama Asta, who just recently graduated with her second master's degree in electrical engineering. She was three. She'd come to my house. And at the time I was nursing Ummu. And... And I thought to myself, she's not going to start school until she's six. And I'm like, she was brilliant. She would just be telling me all the local gossip. And so I said, let me teach you something. So I started teaching her English. And I started, you know, whenever she would come over, take out coloring books and teach her colors and things like that. That was the idea for the preschool. So I went to Sheikh and I told him, and he was always one to support any good idea and encourage you and, you know, support you with prayer. So I told him I wanted to do a preschool and he said, okay, if you do it, come to the school and do it. You know, when we grow, we have to grow from unity. So the work at the preschool started with Sheikh and Sheikh used to say to me, you know, we have two buildings. The school is structured. There's two buildings with a courtyard in the middle. He said, it's called African-American Islamic Institute. You Americans, you can take one building, the Africans can take one building. So um, the preschool started with Shah Hassan giving his blessing. And then um, my thought process too was at the time, Shah Mahi was the director of the African-American Islamic Institute and still is, but not as active. Um, and I would give, basically be killing two birds, killing two birds with one stone. So, uh, Two, two birds with one stone and that I will be able to do khidma for Sheikh Mahi and also do khidma for Shah Hassan. Then at the same time, um, I think Majida was the first, she was a part of the first group that I had at my house studying Quran. She, you know, her mother wanted her, she herself had a desire to come study. And she told her mother and her mother said, you know, you can go, but only person that I will let you go and stay with is Kubra. So she came to stay with me and then after that, Shah Hassan was like, okay, Kubra, you got the teenage girls. So, you know, make sure that, you know, you look after them, make sure that they have, um, that they're studying, make sure that they're praying, all those things. So Shah Hassan, again, was the one who supported that work. And that was, was led to the dormitory and then the Quran school that's there now. Majida was there with, I think, Amatullah, Habiba, uh, Munira Demson, as Usman Demson's sister, and Badria, Sister Nisei's daughter. I think they were, and Inaya from New Jersey, they were like my first group. And um, yeah, so all of these khidmas, they've just grown, but they started, you know, while Shah Hassan was alive. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah. So, you know, <laughs> as you're speaking, other questions come up. Um, so, First off, yeah, we were blown away as we're talking about in the chat with the, the quote of Sheikh Hassan, uh, when we grow, we have to grow in unity. Um, we're not surprised, but it's still just like, wow, yeah, that's so true. And I wanna know, and, and someone I put in the chat um, privately, you were doing such amazing things and Sheikh Hassan saw that that potential in you. And so sometimes when you do such amazing things, you're like, there has to, there's something more driving it. And so of course, you know, you think of like, so like, when did you take the Tarika or when did you um, take Baya, Baya to the Tarika? Um, at what age? Yeah. So I'm just curious to know that. And then we kind of talk about, you know, just more about being a, a girl in Medina Bay. I, be, I, I took Baya when I was 13. So this was the year that I came to Senegal and stayed for for one month with my mother. When we returned, I took Bea and we would, you know, even sometimes if we couldn't get, because at the time I said my mother had opened up her clinic in Monroe and we lived in Loganville, Georgia. So even if we couldn't get to like Zawiya or something like that, me and my mother would make Wazifa together. And um, yeah, so Alhamdulillah, I took Tarika at, at a young age. I, I knew that this was a path that I wanted to be on. And even um, 
even being in the in 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 Medina by as a young student, I still try to, you know, keep my zikr and keep, you know, the the, the connection to the sheikh. Um, one of the advices to the marid is the 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 level with which you benefit from your sheikh is based on the 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 love that you have for the sheikh. So. I can say that everything that I have done since I took Bayah has been Mashallah Sayyidah. Has been because of my love for Shahs. Well, if you enjoy it, you will have to do an interview with you. Oh, yeah. I'm OK. Yes. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. It is. As you say. It's very moving um, and inspiring. So. It really is uh, a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see this all come about. And um, I don't know which picture is, is on the screen, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's us and Umrah. <laughs> us and Umrah, alhamdulillah. Yes, yes, such a magical time. Um, yes, alhamdulillah. Speaking of, of Umrah, um, Sayyidah Kubra, I was I went to Medina Bay last December, um, kind of on a whim. Um, I was thinking of taking a solo trip, which I've been trying to do forever, and that may have been my first solo trip in my life. And I'm 44 years old, um, so anyway. But then, of course, once I got there, I was with family, you know, it, so it wasn't really like solo, solo. But um, actually, let me think about this. Yes, yeah, so you were on your way to Umrah, so I caught you. You were at the, the AAI, at the preschool, um, and then you were on your way. And I remember you you told me that you make a du'a every year. You make intentions to make a every year. And I was like, oh, that's an idea. Um, you know, because a lot of times people think, you know, Hajj, Umrah, just once in a lifetime, especially Hajj. But I think you said, like, you make intentions to make Hajj. Of course, you see that example around you with Sheikh. Um, taking the making Hajj every year, but it's something that I've taken to heart. And my sister Jamila, uh, when she sent her duas with me for this Umrah, uh, one part of the dua was that asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to give us the provisions to to visit the sacred places Mecca, Medina, um, and Medina Bay, like over and over again. And I say, yeah, like why not? So Inshallah, you'll be seeing me in Medina Bay. <laughs> soon. I don't know, you know, how it's going to happen, but inshallah, it's just so important for us to be connected to these, these holy places. Um, alhamdulillah. So in this picture too, as you all know, a familiar face in the middle is our beloved Zakia Grant, who is the wife of Hanif, um, who's also one of the um, great marids of Sheikh uh, Mahi as well. And so I was just so pleased to have her with us on the trip. And Seda Kubra is, she's so graceful and humble and I didn't know she was coming until maybe the day before we were leaving back in December. And she sends me a text and she's like showing me the app so that we can get into the prophet's mosque and see, you know, the tomb and the, where he was uh, buried. And I was like, okay, why are you sending me this? Like, hmm. And then I'm like, are you coming? And so, <laughs> so alhamdulillah, so it was a great surprise to, that she was actually on the same trip. So we're going to get back. Um, say to Kuba, we're not going to let you off the hook. Uh, with okay I have to stop I, you know you know my sense of humor but everybody else doesn't know my sense of humor so <laughs> we'll stick to the script and the next question is you know we I love to talk about um the, the status of women and girls in in educational institutions and in Islamic communities and um I wanted to know you know as a woman of American descent because there's a different um perspective of of just Americans in general, but also 
being a young girl coming from America, born to two American born parents. So, you know, your parents were not from the African continent per se. What lessons did you learn from Sheikh Hassan about, and you've spoken on this a little bit about how girls and young women should contribute to Medina Bay community. Um, yes, and your role in supporting Sheikh Hassan's um, humanitarian work, but we talked about that, but it's more so just about Sheikh Hassan and the lessons you learned for him about how young girls show up in that community, but just show up in the world in general. If you can speak to that, inshallah. So Sheikh was a, you know, of course he was a champion of, you know, of women and girls. He, you know, his daughters are half his and, and he always encouraged us just like he would encourage the boys, maybe even more so. You know, he used to say often in his talks and places where they invited him that one of the sayings is that if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. So it's important for, you know, us to continue that legacy. You know, I think um, Haja Aisha Jeffries talks a lot about, you know, just being intellectually responsible for our own understanding of our team and how we practice it, you know, just knowing for ourselves and, you know, implementing it for ourselves just because we want to be spiritually growing, you know, and the only way we can do that is if we know, if we don't know, then we can't do it. So Sheikh was always a huge proponent of, you know, women studying, Every conference that Shahasan did after I started my Quran studies, he would always call me to open, Kubra come, recite, you know. So I remember one time telling him, Sheikh, I'm afraid to recite in front of people. He said, why, for what? You know, when I have something to say, I just say it, <laughs> which I thought was a very simplified way of looking at stage fright, but, <laughs> but I was like, okay, I guess I don't have a choice. So alhamdulillah, he said, um, that you know it was important for people to see you it's important for people to see you recite it's important for people to see a woman you know so he was very much uh a champion of that and i know that i've said this before but shah hassan was very unique in his approach to us as marie's and his you know just his global outlook and just his his way you know of dealing with people in general he was very uh, open-minded, you know, very, um, very understanding of what was needed, you know, so alhamdulillah. He and I always empowered the sisters. Forgive me. He used to say, ladies first. I mean, yes, yes, ladies first. <laughs> alhamdulillah, we love to hear that. Um, so yeah, and, and I'd imagine that also the role, the... Um, amazing role that his mother um, and his aunts and the other women in the community, the elder women played in his own education has a lot to do with why he values the Quranic and Islamic education of girls so much. Would you, would you say that has a lot to do with it? Um, yes, his, um, his mother, I don't think that she was Hafiz, but she was able, you know, she, she was able to read the whole Quran and she read it often. She was, um, she was one who, uh, how you say in English? She, you can she say kept Quran in all of the Vadundala Quran. She kept Quran alive in her spaces, you know, and he talked a lot about his aunt. He said his aunt, she, you know, she was a big supporter of him when he went away to study and, and, and things like that. So Sheikh, of course, and the Sheikh, Sheikh Hassan's influence was also his grandfather. His grandfather was, was really the person who raised him. You know, his father, Sayyidi Ali Sise, was the Sheikh of all of Sheikh Ibrahim's Marids, but Sheikh Ibrahim took Sheikh Hassan as his first grandson under his under his wing and kind of guided him and mentored him really on his own. And so Shah, if you start with that tradition, Sheikh Ibrahim Yas was a big proponent of women being educated. His daughters are half his Quran and have the sound understanding of, you know, their deen and how to practice it and how to represent it. And so Shah Hassan, of course, follows suit in that. 
Alhamdulillah. And you see that even, you know, I've only been to Medina by three times, um, but just very recently. Uh, and you see the reverence for the, the women scholars um, and, you know, sitting at their feet as well. And in a way that you don't see it so much, even in the States, even in, you know, more progressive Muslim communities. Um, so I know that that has a lot to do with it as well, inshallah. And may Allah um, preserve all of them. And Amen. Grant them paradise, inshallah. And so um, maybe we'll come back to that in our question and answer period because people love to talk about um, the role of women in these communities. But I want to, you know, get to a charge for us American Marids and the work that we're doing here um, to keep a connection between, you know, the American Muslim community and what's happening in Medina Bay. And so um, how can the American Tajani community be of assistance in supporting your service, your Kidma, to keep Sheikh Hassan's legacy alive? Sheikh Hassan, one of the many things that he often talked about was us really establishing our community there. And I think that a lot of times we, because there are so many events that happen, there are so many khidmas to be a part of, which is alhamdulillah, because everybody will go where, where their heart guides them to or where Allah guides them to. But also it is important to understand that Sheikh wanted so much for us in our community there in the States. You know, he said, we should build a school, we should build the Zawiya, you know, we should come together. What we're doing now is like, you know, the Ziyad of Hassan, but we can establish events that are not just once a year and we come together you know, from state to state as Tijani is just like, um, in, I remember when we were younger, the um, Islamic conference that Warfti Muhammad and that community organized, you know, things like that were just as important to Shah Hassan as the development of Medina Bay. Medina Bay, that's not to say, you know, don't participate in the efforts, but it's just as important, if not more important to establish something there. You know, and I think that uh, Nassau of America and the Zawiya project that is going, you know, we can't forget about it. We can't forget about it and get, you know, side, get sidetracked by other things. Like I say, everybody, their heart and Allah is going to guide them to the khidmah that speaks to them. But you also have to remember that we have to leave something. Every, all of our children and all of us can't pick up and live in Medina Bay. We want a Zawiya where we live, national Zawiya. We want a masjid. We want a space there that we can come to every year or twice a year or something like that, that our children know this is something that our people establish. If you go to any Tijani community that is a part of the faith of Bai, they have a firmly established community. They have firmly established traditions, you know, so it's important for us to do the, to do the, same, the same thing. MashaAllah, may Allah guide us in that. Um, I mean. I mean, yes. And I know that we are trying, <laughs> but it, and it's true what you said about the fact that we're not all going to be able to uh, actualize the dream of living in Medina Bay and educating our children in Medina Bay and learning Quran there. Um, and so, and we have the potential if we just kind of, you know, bring our resources together um and and do a lot of dhikr and pray really hard <laughs> that these these things can get off the ground inshallah i mean and it may be generations to come but if we just kind of stay um consistent and just continue to persevere inshallah our efforts will be rewarded and so we have to support each other we have to support each other we can't we can't uh you know, like she said we have to grow from unity one of the duas we have to make is also that allah keeps unity in our hearts you know, if we see somebody in America doing something, we can't sabotage their efforts. We have to support them, you know, and we can't sabotage their efforts. And then if we see someone else doing something and we run and we support that, we have to support each other as Americans too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Say love is the way and love and connection and wanting for our brother what we want for ourselves. You know, I mean, it's very commonly stated um, saying of, 
of the Prophet Sallallahu but it's definitely, it has a lot of depth and meaning to it. If we could really strive to just follow those simple um, etiquettes. Uh, so since you're still living in Medina Bay, from your perspective, in what ways is the legacy of Sheikh Hassan still il illuminated um, and very present? And in what aspects of his legacy teachings and vision are being forgotten or misinterpreted? I think that, um, you know, I touched on it a little bit. I think that the goal was not supposedly for us to run away from our community with our resources. Part of it was to continue to put our resources in our community and establish something there. That was one of the things that Shahaz, and one of the reasons, like, even if we had decided to come to Africa, Sheikh had named the whole city Kosi Atlanta so that we would have our own little hub within, um, you know, Senegal. But some of the ways that his legacy is still being illuminated is through his brothers, alhamdulillah, who were his deputies during his lifetime and helped him to move this work forward. And, and, and the other muqaddams that are all, all, throughout, all throughout the states and all throughout Africa, many, many uh, people are still doing the work. The work that, that's being done is not, you, it's not, how can I say, it's the work of Islam. So it's never going to stop. You know, educating people in Islam, uh, supporting Quran and Quran education, supporting people in their health needs and their uh, food security, all of these things is the work of the sincere Muslim. So in that regard, Shahasa's legacy will never stop, particularly the, the things that he's established. The clinic is still there functioning. The radio station is still there functioning. Um, the school is still there functioning. It needs our support. I know there was a fundraiser done uh, during the Ziara to help to renovate it, which you know is going to cost more than what was raised. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing uh, khidma. But again, like I said, his brothers, Shah Shah and Shah Matijani Sise is the Imam of the masjid there, and Shah Hassan was the Imam. So Alhamdulillah, it's a legacy that was able to be passed from him to his brother, which is a big honor in that community and a big honor for the family, for the Imam Imamship to stay, you know, with them. Shah Mahi is the assistant imam of the masjid, director of the African American Islamic Institute, also establishing his own school and projects that you know, many of you are supporting and a part of. And it's like I said, the work that was being done is the work of Islam. So that legacy will always continue. I think the one thing that was unique to Shahasa's mission was us as Americans. And the focus and the attention and the love that he you know, gave us was really to nurture us and help us to grow and to push ourselves to to be scholars, to be resources for our communities, to establish Zawiyas, to establish Quran schools where we are. You know, Ihsan and those people, they have Quran programs, but are we supporting them? You know, we have to ask ourselves these questions as community and it's okay to support all things good, but we also have to, you know, try and, uh, you know, just really honestly divide our resources and support everything. That's good. And like I said, Shahasan was very specific about empowering our community as Americans. And, and that was one unique aspect of his legacy that maybe kind of fell into the wayside. MashaAllah. Thank you. We are, we're getting those subtle messages and we are taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got work to do, inshallah. Um, and, and as you know, you know, since you still have family here and you visit, you know, often, you know what we're up against, right? Um, in this society, in this American society, and in these days and times that, you know, it, as a lot of things, it's easier said than done. But, um, but again, mm -hmm. we have the resources and we, ha and it takes a certain mentality, right? And a spirit of love. Um, yeah. And just knowing what the legacy is. So inshallah, we just need these reminders as well to kind of stay on the path to, to getting the work done. Um, yeah, it, you know, and as you were speaking, when you said that the first example of the legacy that still remains are his brothers, may Allah be pleased with them and continue to elevate them. Um, and it reminds me of, this is just a little side note, it reminds me of when we were in, um, 
I think we were in Medina or I, one of the places, Mecca or Medina on our Umrah trip. And we were having um, a check-in meeting with our group. And, um, and it was about maybe like 50 to 60 of us. And you decided to speak um, on reflections and you were talking about the importance of making this instilling within the community and our families and our children, like this is something that we should be doing as often as possible coming to the Holy Lands, right? Um, with Umrah Hajj uh, and how a lot of people that were there for Umrah were like on vacation and it's something that they do regularly. And um, you were talking about making the connections too between you know your community or the uh, our community in Medina Bay and then the African American community. And I remember um, I thought to myself, and then I told you later. I said, you know what? <laughs> in my very teacherish way, I said, you know, I saw um, uh, Sheikh Mahi in you when you were speaking. You probably like those. <laughs> but then I, when I think about it, it wasn't just Sheikh Mahi, but it was also Sheikh Hassan that I saw in you, right? And just that spirit um, and that vision. So may Allah increase that in you. Alhamdulillah. Amen, amen, amen. I mean, I have one last question for you, and then I think we should open it up to the rest of the community here. Uh, so this one is, is big for me, um, and I think for a lot of people. So for those American Marids like myself who are considering or dreaming, fantasizing about sending their own children to study Quran in Medina Bay, or even move to Medina Bay at some point in their lifetime, what would be your main recommendations? Um, and this could be both like, you know, highlights and bragging points and also kind of, you know, warnings. Um, and things that we should really strongly consider before making such a move? Um, I think that, you know, people should really be firm in their commitment. You know, like if your goal is to send your child for some extended period of time, uh, the thing about children is they will operate from a place of their nafs. And the parent will be their heartstrings will be tugged on. There's always hardship, but there's no there's no benefit without sacrifice, right? So it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Even if even if you had all the comforts of home, it's still not an easy thing to do because it's a different place, it's a different culture. You're away from your family, you know all of those things, but when you when you embark upon this you make plenty of dua plenty of prayer you know seek guidance in the decision and then when you make a decision to do it be firm in that decision you know and then if if the if you if it's for yourself or if it's for your child who's a student you just kind of continue to encourage them to stay committed you know really that's one of the major things that we as students that have been to Senegal and studied in Senegal that's one of the biggest things that we've learned from our journey that commitment and that discipline, because you can take that anywhere you go. Uh, Amatilla will tell you she took it with her to medical school. You know, other people, Amina will tell you she took it to her, took it with her to nursing school. If you do this, you can do anything. Senegalese people have a saying that um, when you come down off of an elephant, anything you ride is small. So coming to Medina Bay, in all its entirety, not just. Uh, studying Quran, but studying Quran is, is this unique experience. Uh, it's not. It's not easy. You know, anybody that tells you that it is, it's not. There's always going to be challenges, but there has to be a commitment. And that commitment, like you said, what drives us to do khidma, what drives us to be committed to the work and the legacy, has to be based in something inside you that wants more than what you are able to get where you are. You know, either either it's that that love of Allah, the love of Quran, the love of the Sheikh, the love of the spiritual path that's going to be able to help sustain you to be able to do it. So my advice would be just be clear, you know, about how committed you are to it before before doing it, because it's not easy to um, to kind of make the arrangements to come to endure, you know, the, those kinds of costs and all that kind of thing. And then you come and it's like, I can't take it, I'm leaving, you know? So it's not, it's not anything that's worthwhile is, 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 is a challenge. So that's my advice. Alhamdulillah, yes. Um, hmm. I was thinking before I hand it over to the rest of the, the lovers and the group, the beloveds here, 
um, if there was something that I wanted to touch on. And um, I do want to highlight very quickly, I think uh, one of our rural adab hosts shared a uh, reminder. So I'm just gonna share that really quickly. And then we're gonna open it up for questions. Hmm. As I do this, Seda Kruber, what's anything on the horizon with the school? I know that we've had some private conversations about projects that you're trying to start. Anything heavy on your heart and mind about things that you're trying to do with the the, the education of those who are coming from abroad there and even with your students that are currently there? Um, personal project. Uh, you know, we talked a little about this, a little bit about this on Umar. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some sisters in the community that I've been working with with Quran, which is a blessing for me and them because, you know, what the Prophet Sallallahu said about Quran, we always want, even if we are khidma for Quran, we also want to be active in teaching Quran. And it doesn't have to be harder than we think it is, you know. So some of the sisters and the American sisters that are there had talked about wanting to study. So Alhamdulillah, we, we started a class after I came back from Umrah because like I told you there, it's heavy on my heart about just being available, helping to promote the scholarship of the women. And um, and I felt like this, this was a doorway to, to do that, just to try to train myself even to be committed to actively teaching. And um, the only other project I mean, there's always ongoing projects. Inshallah, I see Samiha put the website in the chat, but we'll update and kind of keep you guys updated with things that we're doing on the ground. But um, yeah, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. One of our students is on her way to Malaysia to study asthma, keep her in your duas. Um, it's big, you know, it's not a small thing. And these are people that we need to support because inshallah, they're, they will come back and contribute you know, to our community and raise the bar, you know, it's not, it's not okay to, to be here anymore. We have to be, you know, here. I mean, I mean, yes, she is such a gem and may Allah preserve her and bless her and increase her. Um, and you could tell that she has been under your care and guidance because she has that grace and that humility and, um, and all those gifts, alhamdulillah, and the vision. So may Allah bless her in Malaysia, such a beautiful place. So alhamdulillah, I mean, and may more of our students be able to have such uh, enriching opportunities after they study there in Medina Bay. So I'm going to, um, so I, let's see the host, um, let's see, Sidi Kaaba, is there something that you wanted to share about the um, Qad Muqa'an here? Or just, you just wanted to remind us that, that we are kind of continuing with the legacy of beloved Yafatu and reciting Quran. So um, I, I guess we'll go ahead and start with questions. It, either you can unmute yourselves and you can just go ahead and ask your question, or if you want to put your questions in the chat for Sayyidah Kubra. Assalamu alaikum Habibti, I have a question. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum Habibti, I think I know that voice. We are happy to have you and please go go ahead with your question. Alhamdulillah, Sayyidina Kubra for sharing and Aisha for your excellent facilitation in this conversation. There was so much history that was shared and you know as a people we are one umma, multiple communities, right? And our path to Islam can look like different things. My introduction or engagement or interaction with uh, Tajani Tariqa came through my aunt, Karima Abdul Kareem. Uh, Amina was dropped off when she was 10 and very resistant <laughs> to be in Medina Bay. And she became, alhamdulillah, one of the first Americans to complete Quran, to be Hafisa of Quran. And the model that is there, if we talk about, you know, spreading Islam within the context of the United States and building this, these relationships as a historian, as a purveyor of history, as a lover of history, has there been any conversations about either writing the history or doing a documentary regarding the history? Because I'm in my 50s. I said I was in Africa when I was 10. So this is 40 plus plus years of this continuum of children and grandchildren now going to Medina Bay to learn Quran, 
so that someone does not shift the narrative, change the story, omit the story. And so this is a legacy conversation. So not only we get it right, but our children's children get it right in terms of preserving the story. As far as I know, um, Kaba has been long time working on a documentary of Shahasan, which of course has very much integral parts of us as African Americans and our role in that. And but he's also trying to do a broader look at Shahasan's life, um, specifically our legacy. I don't know if there's any work being done, um, like like books or things like that. I know that Samiha was in. Medina by doing interviews for her, I believe her thesis when she was working on her PhD. So some some documentation is out there. And even as she continues her work, she finds some obscure things that that are out there written. But like you said, it does need to be compiled and put together and you know something that is shared and kind of like formally done. But yeah, alhamdulillah, I think that um because even she she shared with me some copies of Muslim Journal that have mentioned of Shah Hassan, my mother, um, things like that. But it, it does need to be done. But that, that is not something that I know is happening formally. Thank you, Majida, for that. And I know Sister Sawa said that she would love to um, collaborate in that effort and knowing Muslim filmmakers. So inshallah. Are there other questions? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum Thank you so much for all your words. You brought a lot of things to mind. Um, uh, my question is at this time, and I know you've spoken on it a little, but how can we, um, how can we fortify our love for Sheikh Hassan and our actions? Uh, 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 on this path and how can we fortify ourselves and our actions and helping you with all the work that you do once in a while I'd like to thank you personally for all the work that you've done for so many years alhamdulillah it was a blessing being there when you were 13 up to the time and being able to help you when you were finishing for our so, alhamdulillah yeah Kafani was a big part of of our operations in Kosia <laughs> Cozy Atlanta actually taught me how to drive. Um, um, so thank you for that too. May Allah bless you and reward you. I think that one of the ways that we can fortify our connection and our benefit from Shahasan is just to try our best and, and, and increase our efforts in what he's taught us. Shahasan love, love for us Quran. You know, even I remember one time he came to the school and I was making zikr in the classroom and he told me, no, don't do this in the classroom. Wait till you get home. Because for him, Quran was very important for us to have and to teach and to establish in our communities. And um, so for us, I think that remembering what was important to him and kind of focusing our efforts there, like I had mentioned earlier, trying to establish the, the, the national Zawiyah was something that he mentioned all every time he came to the States, um, trying to establish a Quran school where people can be in the States and, and attend. And maybe something that some, you know, I'm, I'm putting him on the spot and maybe something that Hassan is interested in doing like, you know, summer boarding program or something like that. Whereas Hassan, Quran is given the attention that it deserves. One of the things that Sheikh said, yes, is that Quran is jealous. He said, Allah is one, his prophet is one, his book is one. So you can't associate it with anything. Uh, Quran is one of those things that when you focus on it, you have to focus on it. And so I think one of the, the, the major legacies that he wanted for us, and he used to talk often about, you know, my mother, she had land in Monroe. He said, they're gonna build a Quran school in Monroe, you know? So it was something that he really wanted established in the US. And I think it's something we should renew our efforts to try and bring to fruition. Um, as far as the work that I'm doing, keep me in your dua, inshallah. I think that the power of prayer and that collective energy manifests so many things. So please keep me present in your dua and in your mind and in good intentions and in good thought. 
I mean, thank you for the question, Brother Kafani. And that's so beautiful what you're saying. And it just, um, it moved me because I just remember your Seda Kubra has been gracefully, gently encouraging me probably for a couple of decades to kind of find my place in this, you know, since I've been an educator for 20 plus years. Um, and I can just remember her working on a newsletter for AAI, AAI, AAI maybe. I know you're laughing and you were like, you would email me from. I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> like we're I remember writing, writing handwritten letters. I know, but I mean, just your commitment and your level of just focus. And you knew that this is something that we can do. And here it is 20 years later. And you're still just like gently pulling me along. Like, this is what we can do. So inshallah, um, you know, and even my community here, Majida Abdul Karim knows that she works uh, very closely with the board of Muhammad schools you know, that was um, started with the, the vision of Imam Zabidi Muhammad and that legacy. And I went to the school and I went there all my life, but I've never taught in the school. Um, and actually my children have not been there. So so I'm at a place now where these things are heavy on my heart and my mind. And, you know, maybe, maybe finally I can like see like, where do I fit in? You know, maybe this connection between what's happening with the Quran schools in Medina Bay and seeing if we can have something that's going on with Muhammad schools of Atlanta, you know, cause I know they've always wanted to have a, a separate part that is for studying Quran. So inshallah, inshallah, it's, it's coming together, but thank you for your patience and your vision. May Allah, I have noticed it has not gone unnoticed. May Allah bless you. Okay. Any other questions? Let's see. And Seda Kubra, I know that you were mentioning that you've been sending me some pictures. I think this is you, but I don't think I'm receiving them. I don't know if the other Ruhul Adza posts can see, or I don't know maybe where to look to get the attachments because our dear Seda has been sending these photos that she's wanted me to share. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know where they are. <laughs> Unfortunately, if anyone knows, please help us. Um, I'm sure that there are other questions or comments. How are you guys? It's great to see y'all. Thank you, Regina, for sharing the app because I miss you guys so much. Um, may Allah bless y'all. Um, my question is two questions. One, I don't really, I, I couldn't really figure out how to formulate the question, but the mentioning of like women scholarships and the efforts towards um, women scholarship, I wanted to know like, I don't know how could how could two questions one how could somebody support who is from America or in America support really good, really good. from here um you know being here in America how can we support you know outside of maybe funding would be like in terms of skill set um I'll also tap and mention again because I forgot that I had mentioned that but when somebody had mentioned about the documentary all I do in America right now, like my work is around film and archiving black history and different things like that. Um, and so things like that, that, you know, could each person can kind of put forth that's like, hey, this is like my database <laughs> kind of thing. So how could one, how can somebody support just the effort from here in terms of the general effort of, um, you know, supporting uh, folks from the diaspora and from America in their his journey and then specifically honing in on the efforts that are currently happening around women's scholarship and how somebody could support with those efforts around women's scholarship. I think that's a, like a cohesive question. <laughs> well, I think that, um, you know, we, one, we can always support the schools that produce these students, but if you have it in your heart to do something maybe even more specific, you know, we can support the efforts of like somebody like Asma who's traveling, you know, all of these things require heavy resources, you know, it requires resources, it requires staying connected, you know, it's not easy to be away from family and kind of commit to a, a path of scholarship. Um, even like specifically for her case, she, her uncle is actually going there to stay with her for a whole month so she can get situated and get acclimated and things like that. I mean, as a community, if there was a way for us to create network, I think I had reached out to Aisha Kareem at one point about if she knew someone who lived in Malaysia, you know, just create a network. Those of us who have been to college or other places or know people in places, all of these things are efforts to support people in scholarship. 
You know, you may you may be in a position where you work to collaborate with somebody who is an administrator at a school and perfect example. Um, Sister Karima, when Hassan, I think Furkan, um, some of the people, when they came back from Senegal, when they went to Senegal, they were very young. So when they came back from Senegal, they didn't have, they hadn't completed like a high school, a traditional high school program, but she was, she knew somebody, maybe who knew somebody and they were able to get them into a program and they were able to take their GED and go straight into college. So I think that, and these are all community members. I think those kinds of connections and those kinds of links are still needed. You know, we have many students who are here, even students that are here with me now who aren't getting the traditional route of secular education, you know, somebody is willing and knows, you know, like there's this program that if they finish and they can come back and get their GED, we can make them streamline straight into college. You know, those are the kinds of networks and resources that can support, you know, further scholarship because then those students continue on to, um, those students continue on to do big things. You know, this picture that I should put up is actually of my brother's wedding. She had mentioned, did he finish Quran? Shahasan married him to Fatima, Um Suleiman's daughter, and his dowry was that he recite Surah Yasin. So this was the feast, the the um the wedding feast. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yes, yeah, Sister Shahida, um, our dear beloved Shahida Sharif, who is one of our Hajj guides for Hajj pros that we went on Umrah with, um, and the wife of Imam Suleiman here in Atlanta, Georgia. She expressed there is an effort happening called Hafsa Quran Society as well for African American women seeking ijaza and his memorization and recitation. Um, yes, and I think. And Kubra is, is Majida a part of that? Um, I know Majida, your cousin, is very involved in efforts to, to showcase and enhance um, women's, the women's um, Hafiz programs here and making sure that they have platforms to continue practicing and reading Quran. Sorry, I had to go get my charger. Yeah, um, I was thinking, yeah, so it was just a comment that Shahida Sharif made about the Hafsa Quran Society. And I was wondering if that has anything to do with what Majida is doing. I think that yeah. she, um, oh, somebody say yes. It's auntie, I'm sorry, I didn't realize my mic was on, but yes, I said yes. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I think that she is a part of that society. I'm not sure if it's separate from, I'm, I'm not sure if it is the actual one that she, um, help to establish and is working with because I know they just did a Quran reading, but um, but I think that is the I think Majida is on. Maybe she can. It's on. Like, come on. I don't know what what was just said. I was about to start <laughs> and log off. So <laughs> I don't know. I just heard my name, but I wasn't sure if it was Majida or Majida Abdul Kareem, Sister Majida. So I was the kind of. Oh yes, it was you, dear Majida. We were wondering about um the Quran, the Hafsa Quran Society, if that's what you are affiliated with. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you speak to that very quickly? Because I, it just seems like it's blossoming into something so beautiful. And I know you all have an event and have an upcoming event. MashaAllah. So um, I'll try to be real brief. Um, of course, you know, as, as, as Sayyidina Cooper mentioned, I was one of the first uh, girls that came into her house, you know, gave her um, a headache a couple of times. I never realized she was only 22. I'm like, you were that young? <laughs> like, you had us up in your house? So, alhamdulillah. And then, of course, Sheikh Hassan, like, you know, always, 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 what story are you on? Where's this? You got to recite. And I'm like, you know, you got to, like, whenever we would go greet him, we would be scared, like, oh, I ain't ready to recite today. So, I'm going to have to um, make sure I study before I go, <laughs> go over there because I know he's going to ask us to recite. But one thing that always happened is, is um, he would always reward you with something like you would get something back too so you know you're young and that's like oh he's gonna give us some money we can go buy some treats you know stuff like that so just that like having that at a young age and then going into my teens and um coming back to america 
but before I went back to live with uh, Sayyidah Kubra, my cousin Ihsan, not cousin, sorry, brother-in-law Ihsan had a school, you know, Dadaji style. And we were up in there. He was writing the, writing on the, the paper, you know, he made us recite. It was just like, he tried to, you know, do the same thing. Alhamdulillah. And, and it was, it was, there was quite a few of us in there in his apartment, just, you know, studying. And so, you know, when I got older, you know, I, I unfortunately, I disconnected from the Quran somewhat. And so I just, when I got to my, like, becoming a mother, and I'm like, okay, like, you really got to reconnect with this. I used to have dreams of Sheikh Hassan, like, what story are you on? And I used to be like, I used to be running in my dreams, like, uh, I don't got no source to recite. So, um, you know, just reconnecting and then Amatullah, uh, you know, you know, alhamdulillah, she was always an inspiration. And she was my age and she came to Senegal, busted out, mashallah. And so, um, so when we came back, when I, when I, we started the, the group, I connected, I connected with her, like, all right, I need you to teach, come up on here and, and log on four o'clock in the morning and just listen to us recite, you know, because that's the only time most of us have for the day. So we started doing that. It started a couple of years ago um, when the pandemic first started. And then, um, and then, um, alhamdulillah, like she was very committed. And then we, we, I moved over to Senegal. I had a baby, you know, moved to Senegal for a year and just, you know, everybody's schedule was changed up. And then people started to um, kind of contact me like, you have any groups for women that's memorizing the Quran? I'm like, nope, I sure don't. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it's one, but we're not really active right now. And they're like, oh. So, you know, we would go, people would continue to contact me. And then Ustada Halima, I think she's on, um, yep, Ustada Halima Nalo Afi, you know, she contacted me. And I know she's serious. So I was kind of like, uh, I really don't have a group because we're not serious. So, you know, we don't have anything. And she's just like, all right, just add me to the group and we'll see. And so add her to the group. And from there, basically from there, we revitalized the, the group. And I mean, honestly, I don't have, any responsibility in what it's doing now, mashallah. Like I'm kind of like I'm I'm following the lead of certain certain uh, individuals. Like okay, you know what are we supposed to do now? How are we going to do this? But just having that love for Quran starting in Senegal, like introduced to Islam in Senegal before we were even Muslim. You know, we we, we went, went to the Quran school first, and it was like, and then it was like, oh, we want to be Muslim. Like okay, so just having that introduced to me, and it just has never left. And you know, sometimes, like I said, I would leave it because I had my own struggles, but it was just like, they always call me back, always call me back. I ended up marrying uh, Tajweed. People <laughs> like to say Tajweed Sheikh, but he don't like that. <laughs> He's staying right here, but, and he started to chop me up. Like, um, we're going to have to sit down and fix this Fatiha. Like I was his first Fatiha student, really. And so, you know, started with that. And from there, it just started to grow. And And now that I'm continuing to, learn more because I didn't know all this stuff about Sheikh Hassan. I went there when the school was already established and stuff like that. So um just learning more. It's just like this is shows me how much I have to dedicate myself to this. Like the work of Sheikh Hassan, you know, my father always supporting me to go do any type of study. It's just that's the the goal of the group is to get women, African American women in particular, to approach this Quran and just just connect to the Quran and don't leave it. Don't be scared to come and, you know, just try to read this thing. Cause a lot of times people don't do it. Like, you know, the mothers, they didn't get the opportunity to do what we're doing. And so it's like, we want to take advantage of that and just, just Bismillah. Like that's all you got. You got this, that all you have is the Quran. So at the end of the day, you know, that's what you can go to for the, for your guidance. From Allah, when you when you when you don't have somebody to to talk to, you can go to the Quran. So I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, yes. I'm glad that we caught you before you got off. Um, and you guys are really, really um, doing some revolutionary stuff with bringing back, revitalizing that uh, the practice and recitation of Quran um, amongst the women. You know, and you think about. The idea of women being, you know, the first mothers and really being an example for the children, um, it's very critical. And that connection between the African American Muslim community and Medina Bay, I think about uh, sisters that recently, you know, from America went to stay and take their kids, even just for like a year or two to Medina Bay, and they connected with you and you guys are taking Quran classes by either people there or abroad, and then bringing it back to the States. Um, 
to encourage the rest of us who have some background, which is a lot of us in Arabic and Quranic Arabic, um, to go back and and go back to what's most important, which is the uh, the word of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and uh, it's with me. It's it's taking off very slowly, but even just in the last year, you know, just trying to start with just reciting Surah Qaf, you know, on Thursday nights in Arabic. I mean, that's huge uh, because, you know, we have that within us, but sometimes for whatever reason, we kind of uh, neglected that. So we thank you for that and know that it's very important. And may Allah continue to increase your efforts, inshallah. I mean, Seda Kubra, let's see, I don't know if there are other questions. Did you want to talk about this beautiful picture that's on the screen? And also maybe this is, could be a segue to, I know Samiha, you wanted to uh, talk about the, the Khatm al-Quran and the, the reading of Quran that we all do, that you all do on um, once a month for Yafatu. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Um, Sayyidah Kuba, do you want to talk about this picture first? Sayyidah Kuba may have stepped away for a moment, please. Oh. Can Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, this is actually a really nice segue. Um, every, once a month at the beginning of each Islamic month, um, we do a khatam for Yafatu, who you see here in this picture on the left. She's, um, as most of you know, the mother of Sheikh Hassan, Imam Sheikh, Sheikh Mai. She was um, married to Sayyid Ali Yusise. She was the daughter of Sheikh Ibrahim. And, you know, she was a woman who dedicated her life to the Quran and to supporting the community. And so um, after her passing in 2020, we started to do these Quran khatams, um, mainly folks who, you know, had knew her from her time, from their time studying as young people in Medina Bay. And so our next one is going to be this upcoming Sunday, um, February 26th at 7 a.m. Eastern. And I'll post a link um, to there's a WhatsApp group where you can sign up in advance to say um, what jewels of the Quran you're able to read in Arabic. And then um, we actually all log on at 7 a.m. Eastern to read together. And then hopefully if we have enough people, we can finish maybe within an hour or two. There will be a, co um, a collective um, dua and we'll do the khatam together. Um, for those of you who can read in Arabic, we invite you to join to take a juzer more. Um, from those of you who are still learning, we also invite you to come and recite Salat al Fati during that time so everybody can, you know, share in the blessings of that. Um, so yeah, alhamdulillah, and I'll post a link um, in the chat for that. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Yes, uh, Seda Kubra, are you there? Okay, so we will go ahead and I think, unless there are other questions, let me look to see. Final call. I just have a comment, Sadiq. Yes, please, Walaikum Sa Amatala. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Amatala. Um, I want. I have a question for you after you ask or say your comment. So thank uh -oh, you. Oh, I done done it to myself. <laughs> didn't I? I should have just stayed silent. <laughs> Mashallah. And I was just thinking to myself about, you know, the wholesomeness and the holistic um, nature of the education that we receive in Medina by in terms of, you know, learning more than just Quran, like learning the application of Quran in daily life, learning the Islamic sunnah, like learning to live the sunnah. Um, as we were talking about Yafatu, and I just remembered that, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there was a, you know, there was a bunch of us teenage girls in the beginning with um, Seda Kubra. And I remember at one point I used to go with her to um, Wazifa on an almost nightly basis. And we'd go and, and you know, make Wazifa and then we'd go to greet Yafatu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her. And um, we'd be sitting there, we'd be greeting her and, you know, exchanging a few words and continuing our, um, you know, continu continuing some azkar and then Sheikh Mahi would walk in. It was like every single night he would come and greet his mom and sit with her for some time. And it was just like a beautiful thing to say to see. And it's something that leaves a huge impression. And it's, it's things like that, that, you know, like that's part of the education of Medina Bay is seeing day to day applications of the Sunnah. And it's not something that you're going to get in a book. So I was just thinking about that when you guys are mentioning Yafatu and the Khatma that will be happening, inshallah, 
I was just thinking about, you know, things like that, that you see so much, like you see the generosity, you see, you know, people helping each other, you see the sharing of water, you see the sharing of food, you see how they interact with their parents, how they interact with their teachers. I have a really um, strong relationship with my teacher, my quote and teacher, and I learned that from Kubra as well, you know, because she was always serving her teacher years and years after, mashallah, she memorized but and so that left a huge impression on us, you know, so mashallah, alhamdulillah, just so much to be said about the education in Medina Bay, but it's definitely very, very holistic, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, thank you. I was literally thinking I wanted to pose a question to you specifically, so I'm happy that you were inspired to say something. Um, yeah, and just that character, that holistic education, that character education, that, and, and kind of teaching children how to serve as well, right? And you see it with the sheikhs and you see it with the beautiful teachers like Seda Pubra. Um, is there any, you know, the what you hear often is if you memorize Quran and the commitment and sacrifice that it takes to memorize Quran, that you can take that skill um, and that perseverance, right? And that muscle and, and take it to whatever uh, pursuits or endeavors that you have, um, Amatala. Can you speak to that a little bit more? I know you just did a little bit, but if you could just kind of say a little bit more before we go ahead and close it out, inshallah. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Yeah, I know um, it was something that we always heard growing up. You know, when you first when you first come to Medina Bay, you first, you know, um, you're first introduced to, you know, scholarship at the at the level that we were. It's it's kind of a shocker in the beginning. It's like, wow, like people that look like me are doing all of this. People that are this little are doing all of this and stuff. And you always hear that, yeah, you know, you, you memorize Quran and then it opens up everything else for you. You know, once you dedicate yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's barakah that comes with that and everything else becomes easy. And so I saw a lot of people who did just that, you know, even simple things as learning Arabic. And it was like, you know, once you memorize Quran, learning Arabic becomes a lot easier because you have memorized all these words, all these different contexts. So it comes a lot easier for you to pursue the language afterwards. So I know a lot of people that had a lot of success professionally after memorizing Quran, even though they were out of school for many years, they were able to re-enter ac academia and do very well. So that was a, a good example for us coming in. Like, you know, as long as you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you dedicate yourself to his words and his book, then there wouldn't be anything that can prevent you from anything, anything of the dunya, because of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of it and he can just give it all to you. So alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Shukran. Uh, Sayyidah yeah. Kubra. Yes. Um, and Hassan used to say to me often, Amatullah, he said, you'll never read anything better. You know, so it was always something I used to come to him crying like, but everybody else is, he said, you'll never read anything better. You would have for something that we all trying to run away from. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. 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 Such a beautiful closing thought and idea and message. Um, Seda Kubra, is there anything else you would like to share before we close out in Zua? Um, I think we covered everything. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> alhamdulillah. Just, you know, just continue to keep each other in Dua. Yeah. Um, every group it's not always easy to stay connected and sometimes just the purpose of coming together is enough you know for us to come together and to stay connected and opportunities like this one of the reasons and one of when when i was approached by sister angelica to participate um you know i just really cleared my heart and made a pure intention that it was for the purpose of uh, shining light on the work that shahasan uh, did and is still doing because it's still manifesting in us and other things and also to connect the hearts so inshallah uh, the purpose of this was fulfilled and we are praying that Allah continues to elevate him to have mercy on him and to be pleased with him and grant him paradise Jai Rasulullah Ameen. So beautiful. And since we're at the last final seconds and some people have left, maybe I can share my humor and ask if, 
if Sheikh Mahi is around to renew her beta, but he's probably not. Is he, is he away? <laughs> I'm actually away. I'm in Dakar. Um, oh, okay. I had to go, yeah, take care of some things. Uh, we were invited to an, a gathering at the U.S. Embassy. Again, some of the work that Sheikh used to do, trying to make sure we network and keep certain collaborations. Um, we were invited to the U.S. Embassy, and then I had some other things to do, so I'm, I'm still I'm still here. I'm not in Medina yet. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And um, I'm hoping that this has um, renewed our uh, commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost, and to um, our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and, uh, and then also doing the work in the kidma. Uh, that needs to be done in the under the guidance of our shuyuk, inshallah, I mean, and and is the picture of us here, uh, Seda Cooper? Do you see us? I'm not sure what picture is up. <laughs> I see us. That's a, uh, <laughs> I think a fundraising dinner for what's the organization? They do a whole lot of um, different charities under one umbrella. I can't remember the name of it. In Atlanta. Oh my, I'm forgetting the name. Um, but I, I can't remember, but I think one of the Magahid sisters was there, either Yasmin or um, Dahlia. Right, right. Um, but alhamdulillah. So yes. So you are always in our hearts and you're always in my heart. And I thank you for the friendship over the years um, and the patience and the guidance and the wisdom. And may Allah bless you. And we would we would love and be honored if you would um, close us out with the dua, inshallah, of any anything that you would wish to share with us, inshallah. And thank uh, Ruha Adzib for organizing this um, and for allowing me to facilitate. And may Allah continue to increase the, the program, inshallah. Amin. And I'm not sure where Sayyidah Cooper. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Okay. So do you mind closing us out? No problem. Allahumma <laughs> Thank <laughs> ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي العافية حسنة وفي عذاب النار ربنا لا تواخذنا النسينا وقتنا ربنا ولا تحملنا لنا إنسان كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا من تغطرنا به وعفونا وغفر لنا وحملنا أنتم وبنا في صرنا على قوم كافرين ربنا لا تذكر ربنا بعد إدهاريتنا وحبلنا من ذلك رحمتنا إنك أنت وهاب ربنا إننا سمعنا منادي ينادي لإيماننا من فغفر لنا بربكم فأمنا ربنا فغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتغفر عنا الأبرار ربنا وعدنا ما وقتنا على رسولك ولا تخزنا يوم قيامة إنك لا تخلف معد ربنا ذلمنا أنفسنا وإلا أن تغفر لنا فرحمنا لما كنا من الخاسرين ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهي لنا ما أمننا رشدا ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا وقرة عيون وجعلنا للمتقين إمام اللهم اغفر لي حينا وميتنا وكبيرنا وصغيرنا وذكرنا وامتنا وحاضرنا وغايبنا وقرنا وعبدنا وطاعينا وعاسنا اللهم سلا على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أولد والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق وهادي إلى سراتك المسكين وعلى آله قدره من ثار العظيم سبحان ربي كربي عزتي عما يصفون وسلام على المسلمين وحمد الله رب العالمين Amin, amin. Thank you all for showing up uh, and being with us. And um, may Allah continue to enrich and bless you and keep you in his presence. And join us. Amin. 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 Amin.